Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Welcome to everyone who is here. I expect we'll have some more people um, trickling in as we go, but want to get started on time. We've got a lot to cover today. Um, a little of housekeeping first on Liz Hill. I'm an ombuds here at the University of Colorado Boulder. So welcome to our Lunch and Learn series. Before we get started, a few logistics. Um, you're going to notice that you are muted and your video is off. And this is really to try to help um, eliminate uh, distractions during today's program. If you haven't already, go ahead and open up that chat. Um, I'm sure most of you know how to do that by now, uh, but in your toolbar, you'll see the chat function. Click on that and you can open it. Um, we will use chat for engagement um, where you can ask questions, where Bina can ask you questions and also provide information. And while Bina is um, presenting, Georgie and I, and Georgie, who you might be able to see here on the screen, is our Ombuds Prim Administrator. Georgie and I will kind of keep an eye on the chat and we'll field any non-substantive questions as well as park um, substantive questions until the end. So Bina can um, address them at that point. Of course, Bina, you're welcome to address those as you go, whatever you're comfortable with. It's completely up to you. We are recording and that's so that we can reach as many people as possible, especially those who want to attend today and are unable to. Um, and in the next week or so, as, as usual, I will send out or Georgie will send out a follow-up email with any um, additional information or links that we may refer to um, during the presentation today. So without further ado, I wanna make sure we go ahead and get started. I am thrilled to introduce today's guest, Dr. Bina Patel, who's gonna talk with us about the power of micro affirmations. Uh, Bina is an ombuds at the Department of Defense. She is an independent, neutral conflict resolution practitioner who provides an informal and confidential forum to all employees to help them address workplace concerns. Bina's experience ranges from establishing alternative dispute resolution programs in the private sector and extends to working with public agencies and nonprofits as a conflict resolution expert and an ombuds. She is an avid publisher and trainer on conflict resolution related topics such as communication, multiculturalism, diversity, equity, inclusion, and more. Um, I'm also gonna go ahead and add, once we get started here, a link to an Ombuds post. An Ombuds is a blog that I publish. Um, an Ombuds post that Bina wrote on this topic. So you'll have something uh, tangible to take away with you as well. So Bina, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks, everyone. I'm so glad all of you have joined. So this is going to be a very interactive um, uh, session. And so I really would love it if you could participate because I don't want to hear myself talk the whole time. Um, so I just want to confirm, do you all see uh, the, okay, great. Yes. So today, as Liz mentioned, we're going to look into what micro affirmations are and how leaders can recognize value through these small microcultural changes. Um, so with that, let's get started. So when you hear the term microaffirmations, what comes to mind? And feel free to open your mics, or put it and share or, uh, you know, submit it in the chat box. Yeah. Saying thank you, showing gratitude. Yeah, small doses of positive positivity, Lorian. I like that encouragement. Absolutely, saying thank you. I mean, you'll be surprised how thank you goes such a long way, right? Small, frequent appreciations, acknowledging the little little things. Absolutely. So this is one of my favorite things to talk about is micro affirmations because I feel that when it comes to improving workplace culture, it starts with doing the small things and making them habits over time. And you know, for our brains, it's so easy to go into the negative mode or to be um, pushed into that way if somebody else is having a bad day and, and we sort of take on that energy um, of negativity, right? Or we're not anticipating, um, uh, you know, being positive sometimes, right? Some of us do wake up that way. What I want to share with you is that while all of us are human and all of us are, you know, we're allowed to have our bad days, sometimes bringing that into the workplace, especially if you're a leader, can be really um, challenging for everybody else that you are leading. And it can also be challenging for your peers. 
um, because that is like a contagious energy, right? So with uh, um, micro affirmations, I want us to think about it from a positive cultural as um, aspect. So positive culture, in my opinion, is subjective. And each one of us plays a very strong contributing element. How we view positive culture is really dependent on who we are, how we view life, for example, right? And how we view the workplace culture, or even if you're in school, how we're viewing that, right? Any kind of culture that you are a member of or you're participating in is really what we come up with. I even think culture is something we create within our own homes, right? So with that being said, um, in terms of organizations, and this is what the presentation is geared towards, but we can apply this concept to any anything, actually. Business strategies are important for the success of any missions, right? Just like the university has a mission to have a certain number of enrollment, to provide top-tier education and all the requirements, as well as hire the best professors possible to help students and the, the supporting staff. With all these strategies, you know, culture over time grows. And with that, you know, some of the particular behaviors related to culture are, are good for the culture as well as not so good for the culture. And we look at this from a technical perspective as well. So factors that impact everyday culture include shared values, beliefs, as well as those behaviors, as I mentioned. So what are some additional factors that you think contribute to everyday culture? Or think about a student club you were part of um, and the culture there. So think about that, shared beliefs, values, behaviors. What else? Are there other factors? Yeah, Lis listening to each other. I think you, Liz. Communication, absolutely. Yes, Jessica, being supportive, offering those safe spaces. Yeah, I love that, saying hello to one another. And definitely appreciation, absolutely. How about engagement? Everything you all have listed is, it falls into engagement, right? And in, in where I work, and I'll put a plug into of, of my employment later on in the presentation, employee engagement goes a long way, especially with the leaders from the top down. I often tell leaders, it's so important for you to get out of your offices, maybe make uh, some time and go through all the floors and just say hello to people starting from the bottom up. Because oftentimes like in the basements, at the ground levels, you've got more of um, folks who help take care of the building, the facilities departments, those, those different offices, right? And it's important for leaders to come out and say hello to everybody, do a walkabout. That goes a, a very long way because it shows that you value others. And Eric, as you mentioned, it's valuing others' viewpoints, absolutely. So at, with some of the affirmations that uh, you, all of you have mentioned, the thank yous, the showing appreciation, all of this creates value for one another. And with that, we look at long-term cultural fixes, right? Sometimes when we just say, a thank you or a good morning, but it's not consistent, can be perceived as, well, that person's moody or it's only a short-term thing. I don't know why are they being nice to us. Have you ever felt that way? When someone just all of a sudden shows up and, and says hi to you and it's sweet to you? Yes, Liz says yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then you wonder, why are you being so nice to me, right? Well, like, like I mentioned earlier, these are just little behaviors, but if you were in a leadership position, showing appreciation on a normal cadence, even as much as a good morning is very important. I work with leaders where a good morning is very difficult for them because they are um, more introverted than not, or they have a preference for introversion, that just stepping out of their office to say good morning is, it's a lot of work for them, right? Um, and that's fine and all, but it's important to do it because if you don't, you, people are gonna think you don't care. And that happens more often than not. So moving forward to um, the next slide, what I wanna talk about here, we're gonna spend some time here, is that um, you know for long-term cultural fixes, which are more important than not, as conflict resolution experts, and, and there's a few in the room here, so I invite you to also uh, step in and, and please provide your take on it too. 
we turn to communication tools. We turn to psychometric assessments like the Myers-Briggs, right? To kind of figure out how do we build team environments? How do we get people together so they can get along to create this positive culture? Because there, inherently there are people who bring in behaviors that are not always appropriate for the workplace or they're not always nice or just professional. We see this also. And with that, how do you sustain that environment? Well, that comes down to simply looking at um, what kinds of diverse environments are available. Um, I've been reading this book called Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity. This is a really good book for everyone because it's it's almost a workbook that you can use to apply in, in any type of environment that you are in. And in this book specifically, and there's many aspects, to this, uh, many tokens to take away and nuggets, is that the authors speak about there are four major diverse environments. There's exclusion, there's segregation, or they, they called it segregation. I put it as separation, integration, and inclusion. When we look at se exclusion, this refers to people external to the organization. So sometimes people who are denied access for not being a member, for not being an employee. So think about it this way. Um, somebody who's not part of the organization would be I don't know, um, a, comp a catering company that comes in and brings in food for an event, right? What other what other parties are considered excluded in, in this category in your world? Yeah, Kersey, exactly. Building contractors. Yeah, I was waiting for someone to say that, yeah. Staff members at other institutions, absolutely, yeah. Anyone without a card, very true, Winnie, yeah. So these are folks who are not immediately part of the organization. They would probably feel more excluded than not when you have events, right? Um, especially if they're not there, you don't see them, you don't interact with them on a normal basis. Folks who are separated are people who are in a more subordinate culture. And what that means is that they are separated from the mainstream culture. These are your everyday cliques. And we are also part of them. Think about it. Do you go and get coffee with a colleague every morning? Um, or do you go grab lunch once in a while? Or a teammate? Yeah. So these are folks that are, uh, you see them more in a clique. And we call that the subordinate culture only because it is not always part of the the big mainstream culture, right? And then we've got integration where people are part of the dominant culture. This is the what we call the in crowd. Have you heard of that term before? Yep, yeah, Liz says, yeah. In our line of work as ombuds, we often see that where employees may feel left out. They may feel like they're not part of the in crowd. They may not be, um, they feel valued because, you know, uh, their bosses don't show a level of favoritism that they may show to others. And even that is a perception as well. Yeah, Liz says the inner circle, absolutely. Every organization and every institution, because I do believe that everything is a business for the most part, um, has inner circles, outer circles, and then everything else in the middle. And then you've got um, the inclusion piece where people are of, of the culture, co-creating and experiencing access and belonging through integration, individual communications and individual contributions and more. So inclusion is really something that is really difficult to create and even more difficult to maintain. When you have different cultures in a workspace or, or in any environment, we look at it from, well, this person is a contractor. They don't really belong to us. Sometimes contractors are even mistreated. Um, they may do all the hard work and they may do all the work, in fact, and then people who are part of the bigger um, separated or, or separation culture, right? The subordinate culture may actually go in and take credit for the work of the contractors because they don't have a say. Um, that happens a lot. Uh, I have seen that in my experience. And so when all that comes down to it, you know, creating an inclusive culture really means having, let's say at a Christmas party, having contractors present, having people who don't always have access to your buildings, they're allowed to participate, things like that, right? And Christy, I totally agree with you. It means flattening the organization, absolutely. 
And when that happens, when we don't have an inclusive culture, how often do you think people not only feel um, excluded, but that impacts like turnover? How often in your world have you seen that? I'm curious, because there's people from different areas. I see that here. Very often. Yeah, Kirstie, I totally agree with you. And Jennifer, we could table the imposter syndrome um, uh, maybe to, uh, a, that's a whole nother um, topic I would maybe one day we can talk about. Um, imposter syndrome, it's really a, a, an individual, in my opinion, it's an individual thing that occurs. Um, and there are folks who do experience it and they may feel, or they may be a little bit more sensitive to not being part of that crowd. They may feel that they're not part of that crowd, even if they are, or if they, they use imposter syndrome to become part of a clique that may not be healthy for them. Um, so it just depends. I feel like it's in, imposter syndrome is one of those things where it really depends on the individual. And um, and sometimes, you know, if you're not like very secure, confident in yourself, uh, it, could, it could impact you very negatively that you may wanna belong to a crowd um, that may not be good for you, you know? So I think for me, I have seen where we've got very confident, very solid, good leaders who have empathy and, and they put that at the forefront of their leadership, do seek out how to create inclusive cultures and ensure that their direct reports also do the same because they hold everybody to that accountability. And that's really difficult in the long run to sustain, especially if there's changes in leadership that happens over time. So Anna says that in her last job, um, she left her job because of the non-inclusive environment. Absolutely. You know, I hear this all the time. I'm sure you may have heard it too, that people leave because of the environment or their supervisors. People don't leave because of the job. And that is true. That is true. People will uh, enjoy the job, maybe become more passive at the job. But, you know, if the environment, the leadership is not healthy, people will leave, Right. And so, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Anna. Yeah. So with that being said, when we look at dignity, right? How do you all define dignity? I'm curious, because I feel like this is also one of those terms where it's subjective. Yeah. And don't Google it, please. <laughs> Yeah, respect, treating everybody. Yep, you guys are all on the right path. Absolutely. What does that equate to, right? There you go, Lorianne, you nailed it. Sense of worth um, and value. And that's exactly what this means is that, um, you know, dignity is the innate equal worth of each individual because of who they are. So, you know, we respect someone because of who they are. We um, make sure that they feel valued because of who they are, even on the worst days. And let me highlight that. Even on the days that you are upset with them or you're frustrated with them, it's really important to um, show or uh, to their value because everybody feels, everybody will feel it. I mean, you will feel it, right? If you didn't feel respected, or even on in a good day or a bad day, same thing, no matter in the workplace. And this is what we call professionalism, but I also think it's very human to do so. And we should do it is to be respectful towards others, no matter what, go forward. Okay. So these are some strategies that, and this is definitely the article that Liz shared in the chat that I provided how to show value. And um, one of the ways, uh, so these are the things I have used in my ombuds world, as well as um, leaders have used uh, that strategies that we've shared as ombuds. And I'm sure my fellow ombuds here can um, also uh, add to this as well. But, you know, showing value begins with action. You know, words can be very empty. Um, when someone tells me how great you are, I if, if I know that person, I believe it. But sometimes you wonder, like, you know, is it? But showing value comes in small things. I really believe in that, such as a handwritten note. Um, I have experienced this where I work, because I work in a very high stress environment, where when a, the top leadership sends a handwritten note of a job well done or thank you for all that you do, people will pin that up to their cubicles and or they will take it with me. And on the days 
that are really bad or they're really hard on themselves because something didn't go as planned, um, they actually whip that out and they will look at it. And it's a reminder that they are valued here no matter what. So handwritten notes goes a very long way. I still do them myself. I think it's very important that um, each one of us make that effort. And even though, I don't know about you guys, but I have very like scratchy handwriting these days because I type so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Liz. It's so important to do it though. Um, so I can I I feel like it's it's one of those tangible things that carry more value than actual dollars or gifts like physical gifts, right? So handwritten notes always work. Um, taking a genuine interest in someone, I really firmly believe that when you take an interest in someone and what's happening in their lives, it's so you will build that connection. And that connection also goes a very long way because, you know, if someone comes to me and says, um, you know, Bina, um, uh, how is your car? Did things work out with your car? Cause I have to buy a new car cause it's not working very well. Um, you know, and I'm, I've mentioned that to someone and they remember it. It makes me feel so good because I'm like, you actually care, right? Same thing. So same thing. If somebody asks you, how's your daughter doing? I heard so-and-so, you know, they, they were not well, whatever the case is that building that connection, building that bond absolutely goes a long way. Yeah, you're right, um, Shannon. You know, working uh, the the working model of um, it, a handwritten note does working from home is hard when you have to do a handwritten note. Can you mail it? Is that an option? Or send a text saying, "Hey, just thinking about you." Um, sometimes I do that if I if my friends are really far from here and I don't have the time to like go pick up a card, I will actually mail them a note. That's just how I am, though. I'm kind of old school like that. Um, but even a text, some that says, I'm thinking about you. How are you doing? Let me know when you have time to chat. Um, you know? Yeah. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate that. Yeah. So taking a genuine interest is very important. Um, and then remembering the other person's humanity. And that goes back to even on days you are frustrated with them. That is important. Um, you know, inherently people are good they're good. There's always good in someone. Um, it's, sometimes it's hard to find, especially when they're not being nice to you. And that's perfectly normal. Um, but, you know, remembering the other person's humanity or putting yourself in their shoes is something we call empathy is very important. Because if you can understand your own pain, then you can probably understand somebody else's pain. You may not be able to relate to it, but if you can even remember, uh, re um, uh, make the effort to understand, that's very important, okay? Yeah, thank you, Kirsty. yeah. I think, yeah, those virtual kudos also go a long way, absolutely. And it's, you know, it just shows that there's, um, it's like a cheerleader, having a cheerleader, right? And that goes back into um, input and feedback. And what I mean by that is that, you know, providing feedback and asking for feedback is important. You know, there's some people who are really good at um, just giving feedback, right? Um, very good at it. They're very genuine. They mean it really well. That's great. And if that's you, that's amazing. You should also be good at taking it as well. Because when we give out information, you know it's going to come right back. Um, it's very important as well when that comes back. Um, so, you know, giving feedback and taking feedback is absolutely very important. And this goes into consistently recognizing the employee's good work, the contributions, and importantly, the effort they've made in, in whatever they've done, right? So I always think of it this way. Sometimes people will do the best that they can because that's all they know how to do and that's all they can do. Everybody's threshold is very different, right? So it's very easy to judge somebody or compare them to the next person that they're working with and say, well, so-and-so is better at that. Why can't they do that? You know, that comes up a lot in the workplace. Um, and, and I'm sure you've experienced it. I'm also, I'm sure, so sure that the ombuds uh, uh, who are here have experienced it as well, right? Every, at any point in your career, or perhaps even growing up, if your parents have compared you to your older sister or your younger brother, um, that comes up too, right? And that's just human nature. It's going to happen. Um, so it's really important to, you know, recognize people for their good work, as long as they gave their effort and they put in their hard work, let's just give them kudos for that, right? Yeah, and then the quality is a whole nother thing. Um, and then I go into uh, effort. So like I mentioned earlier, while effort may not be perfect, it may not be accurate, 
Um, recognizing that they did work hard, they did put in time is more important um, because that comes back to showing value. It's going back, it goes back to dignity as well as um, it goes back to showing respect as well. So, and so while there's a huge push right now, we see for diversity, equity, inclusion, I feel like it should have always been there, but it's better late than never. Um, all of this happens when there's also a psychologically safe space. Um, and I, I know you guys have heard that term. I feel like I've heard it all over the world, everywhere, every day. Um, but creating safe spaces is very important um, for your peers, for your colleagues, for yourselves, especially and to make sure that um, you can be yourself, you can be vulnerable and that's okay. And you won't be judged in those spaces. Um, and what I really wanna highlight here is um, before I close out is yeah. that, you know, Daniel Kahneman, I know some of you have heard of him. He's one of my favorite authors. He talks about how we have two, two brains, right? Um, one where everything is in, in remote mode or automatic pilot mode and another where we have to make an effort to recreate things to be positive because they have measured um, chemical reactions where positivity and being uh, making that a habit uh, and being nice and making that a habit is also an effort that you have to make and that requires creating new habits. Um, and when that happens, you start to see the world through a different lens. Probably would you probably happier yourself. Um, but doing that effort, making that effort every day in little bits, in micro bits is important, not just for the people you work with or the people you may live with or whatnot, but for you yourself, it's very important because even on days when someone is not nice with you, something such as being positive yourself can help safeguard you as well um, so that it doesn't impact you as much because that emotional impact on you can also be hurtful, especially if you're experiencing something like um, imposter syndrome, or if you have perhaps low self-esteem and low confidence, which by the way, is also normal, okay? So that's what I wanted to share. That effort is what all it comes down to. And that comes in action and comes in self-discipline and it comes with consistency. We have to be consistent. And that's what I tell managers all the time be consistent and be fair to everybody. If you're going to do one something for one, make sure you do it for everybody because people talk and you don't want anybody to feel left out, right? So, yeah. Right. So with that, I wanted to put in a plug for um, my employer. I work at the National Reconnaissance Office. It is a federal uh, entity, government organization um, that is part of the intelligence community. We are doing recruitments right now for not just internships, but their positions that are open. So feel free to look up the National Reconnaissance Office in Google, and you should be able to um, find our website. Uh, but please like go on the website because the NRO internships forms will be open in January of next year of 2024 for internships in summer of 2025. And the reason it takes so long is because you will, uh, probably have to go through a security check as well. Um, but it's a very cool mission. We work, uh, we launch satellites and we work a lot with um, the space and, and providing intelligence from there. So just know that um, when you're, once you, you're in, it's for the people who like this kind of work, um, there's so much to learn. There's so much uh, to understand that about space and about the work that we do in the Intel world and how it contributes to your growth over time. So it's not just, we're not just taking opportunities for these areas where it's STEM, technical finance, HR, there's other functions there too. So please check it out. We'd love to hear from you. There's the email address. If you have any questions, please reach out to recruitment at nro.mil. And um, I wanna thank you for your time today. I think that's all I have. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Bina. That was that was fantastic. We really appreciate. It. Um, yeah, George, you can go ahead and stop the recording now. Um, if folks.